Thank you. So, uh, is everyone here an Elixir developer? Who is not an Elixir developer? I don't want to single out anybody. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, who here has used Lifebook before? Okay. All right. So I'll do I'll do a small presentation. Uh, I was like, oh, I don't want to present. Like I, I don't want don't want to go talk about Elixir if everybody knows about Elixir. Uh, don't want to talk about Livebook if everybody loves Livebook. But uh, since we're kind of half and half, uh, I don't know how is the online crowd. I can do a very quick presentation on Livebook. Uh, I need to share my screen. Yeah, Mike, you might have to enable. Share the screen sharing. There we go. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so this is Livebook. This is this is going to be here the whole time, isn't it? Um, yeah. Oh, look at that! It's gone. All right. So this is Livebook. So for those who are not familiar, Livebook is a code notebook platform and the idea and so it's a tool where you can create and run code notebooks and a code notebook is something that allows you to mix code and text prose documentation uh, so i have this presentation that i've been giving it's a new presentation that i'm not going to go for everything because some of it's like talking about elixir i'm going to kind of go over like the the main elixir parts um and yeah, and I'm going to go about like the interesting things, like for an Elixir developer or somebody who have heard about Elixir before, uh, what is the kind of things that uh, Lifebook allows us to do. And this, like, uh, I know you saw some of this because I talked about this on Elixir Conf Conference Europe this year. So, but there's going to be new content too, right? So, so the idea of, of the notebook, as you can see here, like we have some documentation, we have some code, and uh, we can go and execute the code, right? So here, one of the things that Elixir is known for is concurrency. Is can you read well there? Do you want me to? Wait, that is. That's it. Hold on. To go one. Yeah, I can. I can do one more. Yeah. Okay. Go. Yeah. So, um, so you can see, so one of the things that we know Elixir is good for is like for concurrency. So what we do in Elixir is that we have this very cheap, very lightweight uh, threads of executions that we call processes. And here I'm literally creating 1,000 of them. They don't do, a, they don't do much. They do just, you mean 1 million? Yeah. 1,000 multiplied by 1,000. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm creating one million of them and they're not doing much. They just like start and then immediately terminate by returning the atom, okay? But yeah, and all of this is happening in three and a half seconds uh, on, on, on my machine, right? And those processes, they are all isolated and all running at the same time. And that's how we get this idea of concurrency because they can all run at the same time. They don't really know that other processes exist. So they're all doing their, they can all do their own thing. But sometimes you want them to coordinate. You want them to do something together, right? Or to exchange information. So here's some Elixir code. And what I'm doing this code is that, um, I define who is the parent process and the parent, parent process is the current process self. So all Elixir code runs inside the process. So here I'm inside the process and say, hey, I'm going to be the parent. And then I'm, I'm going to define a child process by calling spawn. So this is going to start a child process. And the child process is going to wait for a message of the shape ping. It's going to wait for a ping message. And when it receives the ping, it's going to reply pong to the parent. Okay, so that's that's when we start the child. Then we send the ping to the child, and because the child is going to receive a ping, it's going to send a pong back to us, and then we print with it worked. So I can run this code, and it's going to print right here. It worked. Okay, this is good. And the cool thing about Lifebook is that, like historically, when I was working on Elixir, I would think like, oh, people they are going to use an ID, right? Or they're going to use the terminal. 
And, you know, I was never really thinking like, how can we try to explain or show concepts because those are limited tools on what they can do and how much we can program them. And even if we can like super configure an ID, right? Like, yeah, I can do that for some IDs, but not others. So it would be like a fragmented experience. But with Livebook, I can think like, well, you know, if we are running in the browser and we can like customize and we can make things dynamic, uh, we can start thinking about how we can uh, talk about this concept, right? So I'm saying, hey, you know, you respond a child, you send a message, you receive a message. We are all building these concepts in our, like you're trying to visualize this in our head. So what if we could just see this, if you could visualize this actually in our computer? So, uh, so we have this library called Kino. So Livebook is like, it's, it's open source to so web application that you install it, you run it on your machine. And Kino is a library that uh, Kino means to animate, to move. So we use that to uh, animate uh, a live book. So what I'm doing here is that uh, I just copy and paste the, the code that we have here. Uh, I know we've never done this before, but yeah, I just copy and paste. It's the same code. I wrap this into this function called render sec trace. And now when I execute the code, um, I get what? the communication diagram, right? I can get, oh yeah, have a self self spawns, a child process, each process has a, a PID. I can start talking about these things. Right? I can say, hey, we have a PID, right? And then I send a ping message to that process. I got a Pong message back. If it was a Jun server, it would recognize what is a call, what is a cast, right? Then would like draw the di diagram, right? So more examples of what we can do. Who here has used task async stream before in Elixir? All right. So, do you know how task async stream work behind the scenes? Kinda, right? So that's the cool thing, right? So, so what is task async stream? So imagine that you are building a service and this service needs to talk to four other services, okay? Four other machines. You could go and say, hey, service one, give me your response, service two, one after the other, right? But if one does not depend on the other, right, we could just talk to four, the four of them at the same time. Right? So for example, what I have here in this code is that I have this list with four things representing URLs. And what we want to do is that we want to stream through this list. So stream here means that this list could be even infinite if we wanted. So we could stream through this list asynchronously starting something to process. So what we want to do is that if I have a list of URLs, I want to go through each of those URLs like concurrently, asynchronously. Right, and in order to emulate going through the URL, I'm going to sleep by a random amount of time. Right, so this is doing simulating going concurrently through a list of URLs. Right, so you don't know how it works? Cool, come to Livebook, wrap the code in render sec trace, and uh, execute it. And now you get a visualization <coughs> of what it's actually doing. So what we would expect? We would expect at least have like five processes, right? Like the current process, another four because we, are, we have four URLs. But you can see here, there's one additional process, which is kind of a, like a coordinator. And now I can go and play with these ideas. Like you can try to see, you can try to understand. What I'm doing here is that I'm sleeping by a random amount of time. So every time we execute it, we get something slightly different depending on like the random value that they sleep. And you can start building an intuition. But it's not only about like building an intuition. So for example, imagine you're working on a complex system and you want to document how it works. You can use Livebook, write the documentation and then say, hey, let's see this in practice. And then you write some code because you can connect Livebook to your systems, right? You can run it as part of your application too. So like, okay, that's how it's supposed to work. Here it is, let's plot the diagram. And then you plot the diagram and the person is going to see that, okay? There's a lot more that we can do just thinking about the visualization, right? So all Elixir code runs inside processes, right? So we have this function in Elixir that comes from Erlang called process list. This is going to list all the processes in the system, okay? All of them. So, and we can ask information about them. We can say, look, uh, let's get the status. So let's see if this process is waiting for a message or if it's running some code. Let's see how much memory uh, the process is using, each of those processes is using. And let's also get the amount of reductions. So the reductions is processes in Erlang, they are preemptive. They do some amount of work and then they are scheduled out, they are removed to another process that needs to run, can run, 
okay? So they cannot run forever, right? So think about it as fuel, like as gas, right? Like they have a certain amount of gas. After they use all the gas, they need to let somebody else use their gas, if there's somebody else. If not, they can go and they get more gas and run again. We call them reductions, right? So reduction is the amount of work they have historically done. Um, so yeah, so... Um, I can get all this information here, and then we, we have everything is listed here, right? Uh, not everything because we are trimming actually the output, which we could configure not to. But you're like, okay, this is cool, right? But what if we could plot this, right? That would be super cool if we could plot the process information. But here's the thing, if you're anything like me, like I can work with Elixir, I can build a web application, but I know zero things about plotting, right? I cannot plot anything. Uh, I can't plot anything. So Livebook has this cool feature called the smart cells that have a really nice plot twist that I'm going to explain really soon. So, so we saw like how, how we can like add documentation, how we can write Elixir code, but we can also use a smart cell. So I'm going to go here and say, I want to add a smart cell. And what a smart cell is that it is a bunch of predefined tasks to do certain things, okay? So one of the things that it can do is that it can chart something. So I'm going to click here and it's going to give me this UI. So I can say, oh, I want to chart like processes. All right, cool. And it already figured out that the only variable in my notebook that it can plot is the process variable. So it already put it here. It's going to plot a chart, uh, point chart. Actually, I don't know what I want. So let's start with that. Sounds good enough. Uh, X axis, we want a memory. The Y axis, we want the reductions and let's use the status if it's running or not as the caller, okay? And yeah, let, let's see if this is good enough, okay? So we got a chart, kind of a little bit messy, but we did get a chart flow, right? So we can continue improving. Uh, we have a lot of uh, horizontal space, so let's add some width. That's better, but you can see like all the points seems, they seem to be here, right? Like in the corner here. So uh, what if we change the scale a little bit? So I want to use a log scale. That's better, right? We got a little bit more spread. So let's do that for the other y-axis. And, um, and yeah, we start visualizing a bit more how our processes are distributed, how much work they do, how much memory they, they, they use. And we just clicked around, right? We, we did not have to write any code. So uh, at this point, you're thinking, that's cool, right? But you, everybody here probably used like 10 other chart build, uh, builders before, right? Like tools that help us build charts, right? Like I could export this data to Excel and plot it there. So the cool thing about smart cells, the plot twist here is that all they can do at the end of the day is to evaluate code, is to tell, hey, Lifebook, I wanted to evaluate this code. It cannot really modify our environment in any way. And the code that the smart cell is evaluating, we can actually look at it, right? So you can see that what it's doing, that it's using this library, this JavaScript library called Vigalite to plot the data for us. And we can, I can mouse over here now, click to go to hex docs, right? Like mouse over the functions and actually learn how to plot, right? So it, no longer we're doing the task, you can actually learn how to do that programmatically. But even better, because if you have a UI to do like to build a chart, but what happens if you want to do something that the UI does not support? Like, good luck, right? Like, you know, like pick something else, right? Pick a different UI. But because we see the code, we can now actually play with the code. I can even click this button and say, hey, I wanted to convert a smart cell into an actual code cell, right? So I can click here. Now it's a code cell. I can go and change things. So imagine that what we want to do is that we want to because the process information is dynamic. The, the amount of work processes have done, the amount of memory is changing all the time. So what if we can plot, like we can animate this chart, right? So uh, we know that Kino is how we animate things. So there is something called Kino Viga Light. And we are going to render this as a uh, kind of a live chart, okay? So what I'm going to do is that uh, after every five seconds, five 5,000 milli, uh, uh, milliseconds. What I want to do is that, once again, we're going to do something we've never done before. I'm going to just copy and paste this code. So what I'm going to do is that after uh, every five seconds, I'm going to compute the process information again with the new processes. And then I'm going to clear 
the chart that we rendered, that we, we animated, that we are now rendering that endpoint, I'm going to clear it. And, um, and then I'm going to push the new process data, the new processes, right? So if I do this, it plotted chart, right? But after five seconds, it should, it updated. I think there is a zoom issue, okay? But yeah, it's updated now, updating the chart, right? So we start with the UI and we change things a little bit and now we are plotting information, right? Like it could be information coming from a database because you're building a dashboard. It can actually be system information, it can be whatever, right? And we're just clicking around and then playing a little bit with the code. So what if we do something a little bit more uh, interesting then? What if I build a web app here right now that has some like machine learning task, right? So uh, let's do some a uh, little bit of a more advanced demo, okay? So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to build very quickly a web app and add some machine learning features to it and we are going to start serving it, okay? So I'm going to write some Elixir code. So as we know, Elixir code uh, exists usually defined inside modules. So I'm going to start a new module here, I'm going to call it my app, all right? And uh, we can use, we have web frameworks like Phoenix, but at the basic level, we have this library called plug. And plug is kind of a specification for building web apps, okay? So if you define a plug, you can run it as a web app. So I'm going to use uh, the plug library and there's this module called plug builder. And plug builder allows us to define a series. Every time there is a request, it allows us to define a series of steps that is going to process that, or that request. So those steps, we call them plugs as well. So I'm going to have a single step called render. And what render is going to do is that it's going to receive a connection and some options. We could pass some options here. We are not passing any options, so we don't care, okay? And the only thing it's going to do is that it's going to uh, send the response of 200, oops, of with status code 200, which is okay, and return hello world. Right, so this is probably the smallest web app that you can, can write in Elixir. And now that we have the web app defined, right, um, we, we, can, we can use a web server to, 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 to put it online, to start serving it. So one of the web servers, I'm going to use a function here that I will explain later what exactly what it does. But I'm going to use this function called killer start child, and I'm going to use, so one of the web servers that we have is called Bandit. So I'm going to use the Bandit web server, I'm going to pass our app, like my app as a plug and say I want to run it on port 6789, okay? So when I do this, it says, oh, I'm running my app with the Bandit web server version 1.1.1 on this port, right? So it started the web app. And in order to check that it works, there we can use an HTTP client like rec and just do a request here directly from Livebook, right? And if it works, yeah. Hello world, right? It's working, right? So we start a web server, we are running it, right? We can do requests to it directly from Livebook, right? And uh, and yeah, and that was super quick, uh, super quick, super easy. But you can see here that when we call Kino Star Child, right? Uh, I said I'm going to explain what it does. You can see that this returned the PID because as we've seen before, like, you know, we are doing everything with processes. So this returns the PID. But you can see that Livebook automatically recognizes that there is an alternative visualization of this page. So I'm going to click here on Supervision Tree. And what it's going to do is that you can see is that it's going to return this something really, 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 really large Supervision Tree, okay? So what is happening here? Well, Elixir is good for concurrency. So if you're implementing a web server for Elixir, what you want to do is that you want to say, look, if I'm listening to this port, 6789, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start one process to listen to this port, but then another process, and then another process. So we start like 100, maybe even more than 100 processes to listen on the port. And then as soon as something connects to that port, right, to, because you want to, there is a connection from a client, as soon as there is a connection from the client, one of those processes is going to say, all right, I'm going to handle that connection. Right, and then it, it goes on to do, to do what, whatever it has to do. And then when somebody else connects, another process is going to be like, hey, all right, I'm going to handle that connection, right? So that's how we're getting concurrency. We're getting concurrency and scalability, right? By starting all of those processes as listeners. 
And also what you want to do is that after you have the connection, after you accept the listener, and it was, if you're using like HTTP2, for example, because you can send multiple requests over a single connection, every time there's a request, we start another process from that, right? So we're starting processes and processes, right, for handling those requests. Uh, processes in purple, they are supervisors, right? And those supervisors, they, they have... Um, all the, they have supervisors as their own children, right? So that's what we're doing. We're defining a bunch of those processes, okay? And, uh, and that's how we're getting concurrency, and that's how we're getting scalability, scalability. But that's also how we get fault tolerance, right? Because imagine that, imagine that something bad happened. Like maybe somebody, as soon as does the connection, they are doing something like malicious, right? They are trying to attack you, and then they make that connection fail. Because those processes are isolated, if one of those connections fail, it's not going to affect the other connections. It's not going to affect the other listeners. And that's exactly what we want, right? And because they have supervisors, so if this thing fails, its supervisor is going to notice that this thing failed and going to say, all right, this thing failed, so I'm going to start another one in its place. So that's how we are building systems that can heal themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what that meant. So in order to not be scrolling all the time, I'm going to go back here to raw uh, and yeah. So, okay, so going back to our web app, we, we did the request, but something that we want to do commonly in our application is to receive parameters. So imagine that we want to say, uh, I want to pass, instead of saying hello world, I want to say hello Jose, right? I want to pass my name, um, right? And then we want to change this in the app. So I can say name, connection, params, name, and interpolate the name here. And if I do this, I can ex execute the cell again. I have updated, I just updated my live app, uh, my web app by doing that, do a new request, and it's like, oh, it crashed, right? And the reason why it crashed is because, um, and the reason why it crashed is because plug by default is not really, it's not going to parse your request if it doesn't have to. So we can just tell it to do that, right? So we can say, look, I want you to fetch the query parameter. So if we're using Phoenix, like your pipeline is doing that at some point, that's why I don't have to do it, right? But I add this step, I say, hey, I want to fetch the request parameters. And then I do that, I'll do the request again. And now it works and says, hello, Jose. All right, so yeah, so our, our web app, it's like, it's a really good starting point. Like we can see, uh, we can uh, do requests to it with some parameters, it returns a customized response, right? That's good. So we have like pretty much the web part of the demo, uh, that's done. But what about the AI part? And again, uh, I can write web apps. I can, uh, I can, I can work on Elixir, but I don't know much about AI really, right? So once again, smart cells they have our back. So one of the things that we have here is a neural network task. So I can click here and evaluate. And what this is going to do is that it once again it has this UI, and this UI has a bunch of tasks machine learning tasks that it can do. So for example, it has speech to text. So I can uh, come here and say, okay, uh, uh, and what this is going to do is that when I evaluate it, it's going to build a machine learning model for us, but also build a form to interact with the machine learning model. So when I execute that, you can see that it builds like this small form, this speech to text, so let me, hello darkness, my old friend, and can record something, ask it to run, and the first time it we run is going to compile the model, right? But after it compiles the model, so it takes a while, but then it should transcribe. And that's it. We have thank you. I just pressed button literally, right? That's the that's all we did. We're like, we can and you can do this, right? You can get at home, we're like, I want you to give like book a try. You can click some buttons. And you can have your machine learning machine learning model running, right? So for this demo, because uh, we could do something related to text, and I actually have a video online. We have sample apps showing how you can uh, run something like speech to text in your Phoenix application. But for this demo, let's let's do something related to text, right? Because it's much easier to work with text. So I'm going to pick another model here. Uh, I'm going to evaluate it, and you can see that they are. So machine learning models, you have the model, but people train them using, uh, using uh, different data sets. So we have a access to a bunch of data sets in here as well. 
Um, so this model is text classification, okay? So uh, once again, it generates a form to interact with the model. So if I run this, it's going to say, um, again, we have to wait a little bit, compiles the models like surprise. Oh, wow, I didn't know that, that's surprise, yeah. So it's saying I am like 98.8% sure this surprise. All right, so uh, what if I say Alexir is awesome? Let's see what comes out. Uh, joy. So you can see it was much faster now that the mod is loaded. Uh, Jose's presentation is boring. And that's disgusting. <laughs> right? So, you know, you can, right? So we can, we are interacting with the machine learning model. But again, the cool thing about smart cells, right, is that we can go and look at the code, right? And I know I'm going to change this code, so I'm already going to, to ask to convert this smart cell into a code cell. And what this code is doing, we can break in two parts. So the first one is loading the model, right? So again, like those models, they are, uh, they are implemented in Elixir, but because they were trained before, right? Uh, we, we want to load, like they already trained the model from somewhere. So we are loading it from Hugging Face. So we load the model and we load the tokenizer because you know machine learning models and our computers really they work with numbers. So we need so every time we're doing something with text classification, we need to convert the words, the text, right, uh, into numbers. That's what a tokenizer does. So we load the model, we load the tokenizer. It's using a library called Bumblebee. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we can get we can have an overview, right? So we load the model, we load a tokenizer, and we start a survey. So a serving is something that represents a machine learning task, okay, or an AI task. Uh, and this, and it's defining a text classification serving, passing the model, passing the tokenizer, and other stuff, right? So that defines a machine learning model. And then what we do is that we define, we create a form. We create a form of the text area. Um, we create a frame where we render the results, and we say, look, I want to listen on the form event. So before we use Kino Listen to say every five seconds I want to do something, here we are saying every time somebody submits the form, I want it to run this code. And what this code is doing is, the first thing that it does is that it renders the text running in the frame. So if I execute this code, you're going to see flashing very quickly, I hope, is that, so when I run this, it's, uh, running is going to flash here. Okay, so um, if I run this, running, it flashed very quickly, right? So that's what we are doing. I say, look, as soon as somebody cl clicks the button, I want to render in the frame that we are running, and then I'm going to actually execute that machine learning task, right? So I have the machine learning task. I'm, I'm going to pass the text to it and execute it. And what this return is that it returns um, a map with predictions in it, and each prediction has a label, as we can see here, has a score, which we put into this like a UI component, and then we render it, and that's why we see the result. That's what the code is doing, right? So 15 lines to set up the form and make it active, uh, and about 10 lines to load the model, and that's how our, our uh, machine learning, uh, how we were able to do machine learning with Elixir, right? And the cool thing is that you can get this, you can compile, you can run it on the GPU, like you, it's optimized uh, to run the CPU as well, okay? So <clears throat> if we want to put this in our web app, Right? Uh, basically what we have to do, once again, we can just like go and copy and paste this code to our web app, right? But before doing that, I want you to do something because if you're running a machine learning model in production, if you're using the GPU, for example, the GPU is really good at doing parallel work, right? So we don't want that every time somebody, so, so like imagine that you want to do like test your Twitter, you want to do like test specification on Twitter. You don't want like every tweet that arrives to go and send that to the GPU. What you want to do is that you want to batch. You want to say, look, I'm going to wait until I have like 128 tweets or until 100 millisecond passes. So I, I want to batch them, right? I want to batch a bunch of tweets that are arriving at the same time, right? And then I send all of them to the GPU and the, the GPU is going to, uh, to do the test classification for all of them in parallel. That's going to be much faster. Okay, so what we want to do is that we want to batch, right? So how we can do that with uh, in Elixir? Okay, so um, we are going to use our friend Kino Start Child. Okay, and what I want to do is that I'm going to start a process called NX Serving. That is going to be a process that is going to do this job of batching as requests come, 
it's going to batch those, those tax classification things and then execute them at once. So I'm going to start this process, a serving process, passing the serving that we want to run, which is defined here. And we're going to give it a name, like uh, my app AI, okay? That's it. So as soon as we do this, it's going to start a process with the responsibility of like batching machine learning requests before sending them to the GPU. And you can see it recognized that the supervision tree too, this one is luckily much simpler. <coughs> And, um, and yeah, and what we want to change in the actual code is that instead of running the serving immediately, I want to do a batched run passing the name of the process, my app AI. So we do this change and then I do this and I run and it still works, okay? So a very simple change, but we, we are making like our system more scalable because now we are batching requests and going to perform better, right? And now we are ready to move this to our web app, okay? so. Let me copy and paste this code. And what I'm going to do is going to say, look, I'm just going to get the thing that starts the model and start here with my uh, with the web server, right? If this was actual Phoenix project, those things would be in your supervision tree, right? Instead of doing Kino start child, you would just put this thing as a child in your supervision tree. That's it, nothing more, okay? So, all right, so I'm going to bring the the starting of the the serving to our web app. And the other thing that I'm going to do, that we want to copy this line here, right? The, the one that actually runs the model. So let me uh, remove this code because I know I'm going to use it, okay? And I'm going to add that to the machine learning app, right? We want to do this. And I'm going to change a couple of things. Instead of receiving a name, we want to receive the text that we are going to do the classification on. And then we are going to call batch it run on my app UI, cool, cool. And we know that this is going to return a list of predictions, right? And for simplicity, let's say we're only interested in the first prediction. So we can use pattern matching to get the first element, discard the rest. And I'm going to say, uh, we can get the label and the score. I'm only interested on the label. So let's ignore the score and say this was label, okay? All right, uh, we just move some code around. We can refresh our web app. And now it's taking a little bit longer because it has to start both the web app and the machine learning bits. But if I come back here and say text Alexir is awesome, it says this was joy, right? And we say uh, just as presentation is boring, it's disgust. Right, so that's it. We very easily just move some code around, right? So you can be working on your Phoenix app, come to Livebook, play with some ideas, then get the code, bring it to your app, and that's, and there you go. You have uh, machine learning uh, running on your web app, right? So this is really cool, but it can be even cooler. Uh, there is something else that we can do. Imagine that you, put, you build this app, for some reason, it's a massive success, right? A lot of users are using it. You start adding more features. Some of them are AI related, some are not. And then VCs like come knocking at your door, like, hey, take my money, right? But you have the problem, like you have to scale this web app, right? Like that's your challenge. You have to scale this app, right? And as you may know, Elixir is also really good, not only at concurrency and scalability, but also really good at building distributed systems, right? So imagine that we are in a situation, we have to scale this app. So what we're going to do is that we go and say, okay, we have to scale this app. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to have like simple web servers running. So every time there's a request, it's going to come to a regular machine as my web server. But then I'm going to have like four machines with like GPUs on them. And every time there is some AI workflow, I want to execute the AI workflow on those machines that uh, I separated that have the GPU and so on. So how do we do that in, in Elixir and with NX? So what I'm going to do here, sorry, is that I'm going to start a new notebook, okay? I'm going to start a new notebook. And this notebook is empty. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to get all the dependencies that the notebook that I have been using. So the reason why, the reason why I was able to use Bandit, Kino, Rack is because I've listed those as dependencies before. So I'm going to get this exact same code here and I'm going to put it in the new notebook, okay? So this new notebook, it's a separate Elixir instance, okay? And what I'm going to do as well is that 
I'm going to get the code that starts the machine learning model, okay? And I'm going to yank it from here, all right? And I'm going to put it on the other app, all right? So I've put the code on this other app, I remove it from here. So if I start my web app again, and I do the request, it's going to fail, right? And it fails because it, we are trying to do like some text classification thing. We're trying to run this machine learning model, but it's not here, right? But because each live book is a separate Elixir instance, uh, we know that Elixir instances, we can make them talk to each other. Each of them have a node name and a cookie, a secret cookie that allows us to talk to them. So what I'm going to do is that for this new notebook that we started here that runs only the machine learning model, okay, I'm going to get the node name and its cookie, okay? So I got this. And I'm going to go back to this app and say, look, this is the other node name. This is the other node cookie. And I want to set that for that node, that's going to be its cookie. And I want to connect to that node. Now by executing this code, okay, I'm going to start my, my app app again, executing that code. And now if I come here <coughs> and I do the request again, it works. Okay, because now we are connected, right? Those nodes are connected and next know like, oh, I don't have this machine learning task here. I don't have my app AI, but I know that that node has. So it automatically sends the text to that node, right? And that node does the machine learning for us, right? And this is beautiful because if we go back to like, hey, we have a cluster of machines and we have four of those machines with GPUs here, right? What is happening is that all those nodes are sending their requests from all those different machines to those machines with GPU. They are batching the requests from all the nodes, right? Like doing the machine learning task and send the response back. And literally, we didn't have to change a single line of code from our web app, right? We didn't change anything here, right? Like trying to build anything like this in any other stack is going to be, oh, now I have to figure out a different technology to make my uh, machine learning tasks work, and then you set up a different technology, use a client to talk to that thing, right? Uh, or you're like, use a message queue to communicate how things go in, how things come out. And with Elixir, like, we don't care, right? It's just like, oh, it's a different node. We are going to connect all of them together. They are going to talk to each other and uh, we'll all be happy, right? And this, and the, our web apps, they don't even need access right, to the, to the machine learning model, right? We don't even need to load them, right? It doesn't know about them at all. And things like connecting nodes can be automated, right? We can use something, there's a library called libcluster that allows you to connect, uh, where it queries like, hey, Kubernetes, what are all the nodes that this thing have? And automatically connects everything for you, right? So we get it for free, pretty much. So that's it, that's our scalable uh, web app in, you know, 20 lines of code here and about what, uh, <laughs> uh, 30 lines of code there. Yeah. Thank you. I think Patrick online has said, I think my reaction feels like I'm watching a magic show. <laughs> <laughs> that was somewhat magic. I didn't realize Livebook did all of that. Yeah, I mean, a live book isn't really doing much, right? To be like very honest, right? It's just like, it's really leveraging what is in the ecosystem, right? It's like, yeah. oh, uh, you want Elixir to, run, uh, to compile code to your GPU? Yeah, we have that. And we have a bunch of machine learning models and we have things, we have web servers, we have plug, right? It's just showing how to do all those things together. I think I didn't realize there was AI smart cells. Is that in the latest version? It has been there for a while. Okay. So maybe I've been sleeping on it. Yeah. So there are a bunch of smart cells. So you can like do data transformation. You can connect to databases. Uh, you can plot maps. So neural network tasks, AI, AI stuff. Maybe we should just rename it to AI stuff. Someone uh, also pointed out, I think it's again, like, is there an app store or is it all just baked in? It's extensible. So if you add dependencies, so we have like, so the first cell in your notebook, notebook is this thing here where you can add your dependencies. 
but you can also click here or type SP and it brings this thing to search packages. So imagine that you want to say, oh, I want add Ecto, right? So you can go here. I accidentally added Ecto, I didn't want to, but, uh, but yeah, so you can just go add dependencies and if the dependency has a smart cell, it automatically registers and appears there. So we have a bunch of built-in ones. Uh, yeah, something that is new on the live book release is the remote execution. So you can now, if you want to connect to a production node to get information from it, you can click remote execution and it's going to allow you to connect to some other node and get data from it. Uh, and something that is also the biggest thing in the latest release, like, let me show it to you, is that we also have support for like drag and drop files. So you already saw it working, but um, like you already saw speech to text, right? But I can, uh, I don't know what, where I'm, okay. So I can drag and drop like an audio file and Livebook is going to be like, oh, okay, you want to add an upload? Sure. Oh, this is actually audio file. Do you want to transcribe what is in there? And then it automatically generates code to transcribe it. And this is a slightly different code because it's transcribing from a file. So, so the, the other version was like streaming audio that you got from the app, the, 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 that you got from the, the web. This one is transcribing a file, but yeah, you can do file transcription. This is really cool. I can get, so I have a database here, a SQLite3 database with uh, all uh, docs in hex docs. This is like a half gigabyte file. I can upload it here. And it's going to take a bit because it's a uh, half gigabyte, but it's uploading. It's going to finish soon. Good, good for pause for water. Yeah, and what's going to happen? Oh, the, the button bug. And it's going to happen here that it figures out, oh, this is a SQLite <coughs> database. Do you want to describe it? And they're like, sure, I want to describe this database. So you generate some code to connect to that, to open up that uh, SQLite uh, file. So it, yeah, it generates like uh, something with all the, with all the tables in this database, right? And then I can come here and say, okay, uh, one of the smart cells we have is um, SQL query. So I can say, okay, uh, I have a SQLite database. I want to query it. It automatically figures out where the database is. And I'm going to say, all right, I want to query one of the, the packages table. That seems sensible. So I want to query the packages table. So now we are running queries on our database and yeah, it's bringing already information. We can say, um, Let's do an order by as well, order by name. Is it before limit? Yep, and then, you know, that's it. We just drag and drop a SQLite 3 file and we are able to like do queries, start exploring it. If you wanted to, if you wanted, you could go and we have download information here. We could actually start plotting things, right? Like using the charts. So yeah, that's one of the thing. One of the most recent things is like uh, just drag and drop file support, and you can try at home. Like try drag and drop an image and see what happens. You know, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. You can drag and drop CSV files and start analyzing them. Yeah. There was a question about how to extend the Bumblebee models. Looks like they currently need someone to add support to that. What's the sort of extensibility of Bumblebee? So Bumblebee is a library and it has its own extensibility things. But the, but the thing is like, so machine learning models, they have different architectures, right? So, and the architecture is code. Like you can think of machine learning model is code and data, right? So usually, so let's say like uh, Facebook launched today like Llama Tree or something like that, right? It may be a different architecture. So, um, then somebody has to implement the architecture, but it's all built on library code. Anybody can build their own models if they want, right? But if you want, but the thing about Mumubi is that it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a collection. Uh, it's an implementation of all those different models. So if you want to implement that, you can send a pull request to Mumubi and, uh, and then everybody will be able to use your model as well. So what was driving the smart cell with the, the list of models that are available? Yeah, so, so the Keynote plugin? Yeah, so a, a lot of those packages, so Bumblebee is like a regular Elixir library, 
So a bunch of those packages, they have a Kino version. So we have Kino Bumblebee, we have Kino Vega Light. So it's basically adding Lightbook specific UI components to those libraries, right? But that's all it does. It's like, it's, those are the UI components. Cool. Is it a reasonable thing to think of Kino as the smart cell? Yeah, Kino is, uh, because, we, yeah, Kino is like how you extend Lifebook. And smart cells is one of the ways where you extend it. You can also like do custom outputs and other stuff. Uh, but that, can, but and smart cell is one of the ways. So right now you cannot register new file extensions, but in the future are going to allow you to register what happens when you drop a file extension. Maybe you have like a proprietary file format, for example, and you want to support it, you would register that through Kino as well. So right. everything that is about extending Livebook, it is in the separate Kino library that runs alongside your code. The live Vega Light updating, that was pretty cool too. Yeah. Um, so if you were doing uh, your remote serving and uh, the input is large, so you want to use like FETs or Amnesia or something, is there some shortcut that you can use to say, you know, uh, access it this way when it gets to the other end so that you only need to send the reference to the data? You have to send the data, right? Yeah. There is no, it's another machine. One way or the other, you have to send the data. All right. So, right. So maybe there is a discussion of like what is the best data to send, right? Because ultimately those things they are becoming they are becoming zeros and ones. So there's a question if you want to send the text, or if you want to send uh, the text after it was tokenized and then it became a vector. Right. But it, there is no escape from sending it. Yeah. 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 I guess I just was just thinking of in, instead of a large message, you could be. It could be in a common location that both machines can see. You could. So what what you could, yeah, that, that could be, be doable. You could say, hey, you know, like uh, for this particular thing that I'm doing, I know it's on S3. So I'm going to do something and just tell that machine to get that from S3. Yeah. That is something that you could do, yeah. yeah. Any other questions online, Mike? Uh, yeah, if we scroll back a little bit, there was one from Rob, who <clears throat> I know uh, is a big fan of Livebook, and he says um, his favorite use case is to give code-heavy presentations, a little bit like we've been seeing tonight. Uh, have there been any developments lately to help with presentations, such as <coughs> splitting up your notebook into slides or exporting to PDF? Uh, no, not really. Uh, the thing that we added, uh, Rob is probably aware that we have these views mode and then we have a presentation mode oh, what? and here on the on the the bottom right you can choose different ways to see your so one of the ways like code z and code z removes all the documentation and only has the code in case like you want to refactor the code in your notebook right you can say hey i want to focus on the code uh you can also there's a custom mode where you choose exactly what you want to show like look i want to show sections i want to show the you control right but uh, we have two presets, basically. One is code Zen, trying to look at the code. The other one is the presentation mode. And the presentation mode, um, it only shows like the, the active cell, right? So if you don't want like people to see spoilers, then you can. Um, what I do is that I cheated. I basically, if you look at the source here, uh, mm, let me disable this. If you look at the source here, what I did is that I've added divs with big empty height, and that's how I got the spacing. Um, um. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, we could we could do like some generating a PDF is something that we want to do. There is an open issue. I think presentation is a bit harder. But the other thing is that, yeah, uh, the other thing is that you know it. Live books, they are, at the end of the day, they are markdown documents. So it, it may not be necessarily hard to export the issue markdown and maybe have somebody build the slides or something else from the markdown uh, because there are tools that do that. But yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not something we are, it's more of a side effect of how to use Livebook. It's not like one of the 
the biggest concerns. Okay, thanks. And I see another one here. Um, uh, where was it? Where was it? From Patrick. Uh, was there a plan to extract out the Livebook app shell as its own reusable library? The Livebook what? The application shell. I think particularly for the desktop version, is that what we're referring to there, Patrick? Oh, like uh, the thing that we use to build the desktop app? Yes. Yeah, the plan is to, it, if you go to Livebook, it's already a separate repository and we want to eventually make it a library once we feel it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good enough. Uh, but you can probably use today as a Git dependency, most likely, uh, because you know, it's a separate repository. We already treat it as a separate application. So you could use, like you can do like a Git dependency, pass the sparse option, point it to that directory, and that should work. Uh, but yeah, it's in the plan. Um, okay, great. Well, I think that's it from online. Any other questions here? It doesn't have to be live book related, by the way. Um, I haven't really used Livebook a lot, and part of the reason for that is that I'm not sure about all the common use cases or how other people maybe in this room are using it. Yeah. Can you give me like top three or some good tips about how I could get some benefit out of Livebook in my average developer life? Yeah. Could, could you hear that, Mike? Could you hear the question? Yes, we got that one. Beautiful. Yeah. So, um, so um, there is one very simple way that you can use, which is just like replacing IEX if you want, right? Just like playing with ideas, exploring. If you're a library author, <coughs> you can actually uh, ship a, you can ship live books as part of documentation, xdocs, which automatically recognize that. And it's going to generate like a live, a live button to run it inside Livebook. So those are like very easy, accessible ways of using Livebooks. Like, oh, for documentation or for learning. Uh, but beyond that, there are a lot of things that you can do, which is kind of a problem for us because it's like, how do you market something that can do like basically anything, right? So uh, one of the things here is that uh, thinking more about like as an editor developer, uh, if you go to Livebook and on this like welcome to Livebook thing, one of the starting guides that we have, uh, it has a section talking about like different ways that you can do this. So you can, so one of the things that you can do with Livebook is that you can actually, when you build a notebook, you can deploy them. And you can even deploy them with Docker. You can say, hey, I want to generate a Docker image that only has this notebook that I'm going to run. And that, so that can be a way for you to build small apps that you want to share, uh, like maybe something internal that is going to work against our database and you don't want to build a whole UI, you can consider using Livebook for that kind of thing. Some people use Livebook to connect to their like production systems. You know, so in this document here, we have Elixir integration use cases. So it talks a little bit about like different use cases, things that you can do. Uh, and yeah, and, but yeah, it's pretty much like, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. I think that's, that's the summary. One of the other things that was pretty great about using LiveView that was different was Dockyards Academy. They did the entire sort of yeah. curriculum for teaching new Elixir developers, Elixir in Livebook and all of the exercises and so forth there. I think that's pretty, pretty great use case. The tutorials. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions, but I guess just immediately with regards to this, um, I, uh, I've um, come from um, JavaScript background in the past, yeah. observable, uh, yeah, yeah. something that I've used a lot, particularly Jeremy Ashkenaz. He was uh, one of the founding uh, members, so we kind of followed him uh, on his journey. Um, uh, so this concept is like, very familiar. It's really cool. Yeah. Is that something you like, you know, when you formulating the idea, it's most of the time it's to scratch your own itch, right? You know, yeah. And apply it to your own use case. Yeah. So, so the, so I assume it's like kind of why Livebook and 
Yeah, just the journey you've gone on to actually like, yeah, yeah like it was a scratching your own itch. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I don't know if it was two or three years, uh, but two or three years ago, we started like Elixir uh, and machine learning effort. That's why we can run those models today and we can run Elixir on the GPU. Um, and one of the things, so we knew we had to do a, some projects that would be important. And one of the things that is really common in the Python community, they are Jupyter Notebooks. Right. And Jupyter Notebooks, they are actually extensible. They can actually like, and they're, they are like uh, an Elixir kernel for Jupyter Notebooks. So we knew we had to do notebooks, but Elixir is good for like, Elixir is known primarily for building lab stuff. So it felt like a lost opportunity if we like, I, I'm completely okay with using something else. So all the machine learning stuff that we do like is using like C++ library from Google, Facebook. It's like we are not re-implementing the whole machine learning st stack, right? Uh, but for this, it felt like it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't try to tackle it because it's something that we are good at. It's something that Elixir is different enough to 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 like to to maybe spark different ideas, right? Like some of the issues that people complain about, like Python notebooks, like because they're like, oh, they are hard to reproduce because in Python notebooks you can execute things in any order, and that may make things chaotic. It's like those are things that being a functional programming language, Elixir would be able to to tackle. So it felt like it felt like we can we can do our own version. And when I was thinking about this, I was not, I knew about, I knew about observable. It's great. I think for, for, for JavaScript, like their whole design approach makes total sense. Right. And I think it's also an example of like, Hey, you know, if you're building something for JavaScript, because JavaScript runs in the browser, it, for them, it also doesn't make sense to rely on Jupyter notebooks because there is a whole other set of properties that they can leverage because it's JavaScript and it runs in the browser. And for us, it felt the same. There are a lot of people doing things like, oh, we want to make like Jupyter Notebooks uh, collaborative. Like this is actually collaborative. I, didn't, I, I mean, there are way too many features I didn't show, right? But one of them was like, it's collaborative. Like other people can, can join and, right? So I was like, we want to, we, we should do this. We should explore. And, um, yeah, and and then as we were exploring, we were getting like a bunch of different ideas and things that we should do. So smart cells, like when I started, I, I was not thinking about smart cells, but as we thought about the problem space and we saw other people I know innovating in this area, uh, we were like, oh, that makes sense. That would be perfect for us, right? And uh, try all those different ideas. Yeah. It has been like a really fertile ground for like, trying uh, all those concepts. Um, as a follow-up to that, um, because when I first saw live book, I was thinking, oh, that's a bit like Jupyter. Um, and then in X being numerical computation, it, it seemed to have all arisen conveniently before, like just before or at the same time as like the AI revolution in general. Yeah. I'm curious how, so did you see this coming? Um, I had, I had uh, privileged information. Uh, I have an <laughs> investing club as well. It's uh, one million to join. Uh, and we know pretty much what is happening with AI like one year before. So, no, it was, it was like total, total. Uh, it's part, yeah, so I'll tell the story. Uh, so, uh, Sean Moriarty, who has, you know, been uh, people been a busy tell, boy and essential on everything machine learning in Elixir. So uh, one of the libraries I did not mention here is Axon, which is our neural network library for Elixir. So he wrote a book called uh, Genetic Algorithms in Elixir, right? Which is in the AI thing. And he wrote it for fun. He liked Elixir, uh, the things like the library, the, uh, he, like the, li the thing, the concept that he used in his book they are not necessarily optimized. So it was like, you know, like I want to write a book. Like I think like those ideas are interesting. I like Elixir. I'm going to write this book, right? So I think on the day or on the week where the book was announced, uh, uh, I, I was like, hey, you know, there is because one of the things like I feel like one of my jobs like is to support the Elixir community. That's and uh, to support people having 
new ideas and bringing elixir to new domains i need to to make sure that i'm there and make sure that elixir or me or the elixir team we are not blockers in any way and i always thought like oh it would be nice we could do ai stuff because uh you know like the since elixir got the ability erlang got the ability of running like external code uh, via dirty leaves which was about eight years ago like we can run machine learning workflow. Like we can run because Python is calling to C libraries. That's what Python is doing. Yeah, we can do that as well. So why not have machine learning stuff? So all the way that, that the book was published, I was like, hey, there's somebody else thinking about uh, uh, machine AI and Elixir. So I sent an email to Sean uh, or asked people to do some introductions. Uh, and I did some other tweets. So there is another developer in China, Jacko. And then we, the three of us started talking and say like, hey, can we actually make this thing happen in Elixir? Uh, and then there was another library. So there's a library in Python called Jax. It's a Google library. It's for like DeepMind, whatever they call their group there. Uh, and in this library, so like, I think it was Jack who said like, oh, maybe we can try this approach. So like this, this Python library from Google and <coughs> which is uh, as an alternative to like other machine learning frameworks in, in Python. And then it's like, oh, that's a good library. And then I was reading the documentation. I, and I think that was the moment where it was like, things really started to click and I was like, okay, I think this is really going to work. Because I was looking, reading the library documentation and it said things like, when you're writing uh, code in JAX, you should treat your data structures as immutable. And I was like, oh, I just happen to know a programming language where I don't have to treat the data structures as immutable. They are immutable, right? And then later on, like, there was like, oh, when you write code uh, in JAX, you should write it on a functional style. And then I'm like, oh, I know a programming language where <laughs> you can write code in a functional style. So, and then we saw how that library is implemented and it uses like this Google XLA thing, which is how it compiles things to the GPU. Um, and then uh, Sean started uh, writing bindings for it, for this C library. And uh, he did a proof of concept where we got some like very simple algorithms. We did like a, an Elixir version. We did this XLA version and it was like 3000 times faster um, because it was running on the GPU and 300 times faster if it was just running using their like native compilation algorithms. And then, and then we started building like the NX abstraction and, you know, and then Sean, so Sean is working with me on, on rather I'm working with Sean on NX and then Sean did Exxon and then Jonathan did Bumblebee, which is the collection of models. And then we just start building this ecosystem. Like uh, we have like something that is an alternative to pandas in Python called Explorer and like the the ecosystem is growing and it just happened from those events and then it's very it's it's luck really because um you know we started what one year and a half before like ai really exploded and everybody went to do ai stuff yeah and it was able to to put us like you know uh, give us a, a a good head start yeah sean actually wrote the, the post on the dockyard um block uh, a month ago or so, three years of NX. Three years, years yeah. You, you, anyone interested, it's like more up to that story. It might be luck, but it looks like genius. And yeah. you yeah. share the link of the investing club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's loaning Blackbird money, that's why he's here. <laughs> cool. I think we're probably good for time and questions. Um, one more? Yeah, just one last one. Um, so we have the models that are written in Python that you can convert to ONX and then load it in Axon and run it on the GPU, right? Yeah. But there are also models written in Python which are like time series kind of stuff, which are like you can't convert them to ONX. So do you have any success stories with those kind of models? Yeah, so there are, there are two ways mainly where you can execute a machine learning model in Elixir. One is convert to an ONX 
and then in that so two way right and then in that branch if you, could, if you have an onyx model you have two options you can convert it to an axle model yeah and then run using annex yeah. but we also have a onyx runtime binding so you can use the onyx runtime bindings to do that okay. and the advantage of this onyx runtime is that uh it's actually faster on the cpu oh, okay uh because the yeah, it's actually fast on the CPU. It's slow on the GPU, so it's good to have like alternatives in case depending on what you're running. So, or you do the next one, or you implement the model. Yeah, that's it. So, if if it doesn't work for Onyx, then you have to think about uh, can I implement this model, and in, uh, in yeah. yeah, using using the abstractions that we we have been used to build all of these, right? So we have the abstractions, then we should look at them like, hey, can I implement this? Yeah. Brilliant. I think we'll have a call there and go and have some chit chat. And thanks so much, Jose. Really Thank appreciate you. what you've shown us there. Hope yeah. you have enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah.